Hello, everyone, and welcome to How Goods Innovation Online Series. My name is Leah Wolf. I'm the head of regenerative education and content here at HowGood. Um, we've been hosting these conversations with thought leaders for a little over a year now, talking about everything from biodiversity to labor conditions to soil health and, and well beyond. Um, and so this series in particular is focused on regenerative supply and suppliers and specifically how we can scale up regenerative ingredients and innovate in a way that doesn't compromise the integrity um, and transparency of our regenerative goals and ideals. I'm so excited to be speaking with two really brilliant leaders today who have built ethical sourcing into the very core of their organizations from day one. We have Sorella Rada, who is the co-founder of Simply Good Ingredients and Tucker Garrison, who is the co-founder and CEO of Imlakesh Organics. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea of our agenda today, we'll have our introduction. Welcome to the introduction. Um, we will have a community or a panel discussion for about 30 to 35 minutes. Um, then we'll have the opportunity to have some community discussion and networking and breakout rooms. And finally, we'll have a Q&A with the speakers uh, finishing up right at the top of the hour. We also have some upcoming sessions that I hope that you'll be able to join us for. On October 7th, we're going to be joined by Kelly Williams, who is with Futamora, and Jay Ashworth from Associated Labels and Packaging, and they're going to be talking about the new material age in packaging. And we're also very excited to announce that we are adding a session on October 14th with Ryan Ciroli and Granish Bandal from Cargill, and they're going to be talking about scaling regenerative agriculture, strategies and insights, from one of the world's largest and oldest agribusinesses. So we're very much looking forward to that. Um, you can sign up for either and all of our innovation series sessions at howgood.com slash innovation series. Great. And so with that, I'd love to get started. Thank you, Tucker and Sorella, so much for being with us today. Really excited to uh, talk with you both um, about what ethical sourcing means to you and how you've built your organizations with that really as one of the core tenets and values of your businesses. Um, we've been starting off these sessions by uh, talking about a number that we feel represents sort of intro by numbers. So a number that represents your organization and something that either is an achievement that you're excited about or um, something that you feel is at the core of your organization. And so I can start um, and I'll say, um, the number eight, which is the number of core impact metrics um, that go into our How Good One score to give people a really wide and nuanced view of the sustainability and regenerative nature of their ingredients. Do either one yeah. of you want to get started? Yeah, I can go next. Uh, for us, it's 210. Uh, it was the first number of farmers that we started working directly and really putting these practices um, into the market. Amazing. Beautiful. Thank you so much for, for having me on. And uh, Alexander, I see you on here. Thank you for making How Good possible with all the things you do. I am also going to say the number eight, which came to me before you said it as well. So we're on the same page. Uh, and, and to me, the number eight is it's, it's a number of unity. Um, and it's a, it's a representation of, to me, uh, one human family and all living on one planet. And that's a big part of what we're seeking to do is is really weave together um, that recognition that we're all here to support one another. That's really beautiful. Thank you so much. I think that's also a perfect transition into the question that I'd like to get started with, which is for both of you, but either of you can start, um, which is just what does ethical sourcing mean to you, to your organization? What does regenerative sourcing mean to you? And are, is there a difference between those two things? Yeah, um, I can get started on, on that. Um, I think ethical sourcing for us, it really is doing the right thing for the consumer by bringing products of integrity of nutrient dense ingredients and, and, and really bringing the product of traceability to the consumer is doing the right thing for the environment by focusing on the practices of how the products are being grown. Is it um, the soil health, how are we keeping the biodiversity and how are we really um, regenerating, regenerating those farmers that we're working with. And then third for me really is focusing on 
um, the farmers itself, right? Are we giving them the right condition? Are we giving them the right payment for its hard work and what they're putting into, into the soil and the products they bring into the consumers? Fantastic. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add to that and thank you for kind of building that 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 base platform. And I think that to me and within our organization, that ethical sourcing to me is really it, it exists in the paradigm of what I would call doing good, right? It's this idea that. Um, we're not doing bad, but we're doing good. Um, I think one of the pitfalls and challenges with um, quote unquote ethical sourcing or this idea of doing good is that uh, in many ways, I think people throughout time, especially if you're talking about colonialism, when you're talking about the, the history of oppression, that a lot of those people were justifying their actions by saying we're doing good. And so I think that to me, we're obviously shifting that idea and ethical sourcing today hopefully means something different. But I think that that's really this, this trap we can fall into of like, oh, I'm doing good. And to me, if we're shifting into the paradigm of regenerative, right, that regenerative paradigm is about actually, it's a much more receptive type of action. It's a process that involves a lot of listening. It's a process that involves a lot of um, sensitivity to the ecosystem, to the people, to the place. And ultimately, I think what we're exploring with regenerative, the, the whole regenerative paradigm of business, but also in sourcing is how are we uplifting and creating um, potential within communities and within ecosystems? And really that comes down to essence, right? And essence, essence is about what does this place and people want to be, right? And a lot of this thinking for me um, has really been spurred through my own experience, but then Carol Sanford, who many of you probably know that are on this call has been a huge inspiration for me um, in thinking about that idea and kind of moving from that place of um, doing good to actually working in a regenerative, in a regenerative way. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I think to Tucker's point, I think regenerative practices and the way that um, we, we believe what regenerative is to keep that biodiversity. These communities have been doing it for thousands of years, right? They have been working on these practices of creating, of rotating its soil um, to keep that health, to bring some nitrogen and, and phosphorus to create those nutrient dense uh, crops. And now we're coming into this wave of um, getting some momentum on what truly is regenerative. And um, without regulation or just really understanding what that is. I think that the consumer can get lost onto understanding what are the, the, the products of the farming communities that are really true in doing this versus just being a buzzword in, into the market. And um, organizations like Regenerative Organic Alliance that you know is leading the efforts of of certification and, and really understanding what are the things that we should uh, look into for to create that differentiation in the market, I think is really important because these communities have been doing it for, for a very long time, but let's give them credit for the work that um, they, they've been doing and leading that effort into the agricultural field. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, I would love to maybe ask you both to build on that a little bit in, in talking about the ways in which you communicate the value of the product to your, to your customers, you know, like how are you um, communicating to them the hard work and the, the, the greater value of regenerative products um, and, and making sure that you're doing, you know, doing justice to the producers who are working so hard to, to make the ingredients for you. Yeah, I think that's the, that's probably one of the toughest <laughs> things to do is just creating that education and, and having that um, that moment, you know, attention spam of someone to really understand the differences of thousands of, of products and brands that are out there. Uh, for us, as simply, we truly believe in certifications. Uh, we truly believe into if we they're farming communities that don't that are not ready for it then we create programs um, that they could get to that step um, we have transitional organic programs so communities that is starting from step one and been doing um, conventional work 
um, and we match that program to customers and partners that are willing to support that journey. Um, so we, we truly believe into um, in order to educate, let's work together with all these brands that are um, trying to send the same message and, and let's do it by, by certifications and parties like Fair for Life, Fair Trade, um, USDA Organic, um, regenerative organic alliance that are really um, creating these programs so the consumer can can be more educated um, but then also channels like this right just being able to have conversations with um, Tucker with yourself Leah and and having that message I think we're stronger together and 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 by being able to have a um, a bigger voice of of what we're trying to to promote yeah I'll just, yeah. I'll just try to briefly briefly add to that and just say that, you know, I, I feel grateful that we're living in a world where people more and more are waking up to the, the very real fact that um, everything that we do affects everyone and everything else. And that by living, you know, in this age of incredibly rapid technology communication, we can actually see and understand those, those impacts. And so, you know, if you kind of zoom into that level, a couple of things that we really uh, strive to do are to just engage directly with people and and tell them real stories right about our sourcing about the agroforestry work we're doing about the farming communities that we support and then really try to um, express differentiation in what we do right and and I'm, I won't get into it now but you know the difference between um, monocropped cacao that's grown in a clear cut, you know, monoculture where the rainforest was slashed and burned to grow, you know, this, this kind of like cardboard Roma tomato of cacao is a really different um, experience than growing in an agroforestry system that's mixed with timber and other amazing fruit crops that has medicinal herbs growing in those system that's sequestering carbon that has a really healthy soil food web. And so I think that there's that piece, but the one other thing I'll add that I think is true and is probably one of the biggest challenges we have in this work is that, um, you know, some of you may have heard this, but I, I met with the, uh, I met in the, like the first six months I started in Lakesh, I met with the director of marketing for Martel Toys. They created Barbie and I swear I'm going somewhere with this story. Uh, and he said, you know, all the good work you're doing in the world, all the things that you, you know, you're doing, it's, it's great. But the truth of the matter is about 90% of people are still living in the vibration of what is in it for me, right? And that you have to answer that question for somebody that is buying a product. What's in it for them? Why is it better for them? Why is it good for them? What is it going to do for their life? And if you can answer that question for them, then you've opened this door where you can share with them all the other ways in which their decision is good for them because it's good for the planet. It's good for the people where it's being grown. It's good for health and nutrition, all those other elements. And so I think that that's really this big leap that this movement in the regenerative agriculture space has to make if we're going to gain the kind of momentum and traction that's going to take this to being truly a global force in agriculture and feeding humanity. Right. And I think it's, I think that speaks really well to this idea of bringing people along on the journey of regenerative, right? Like it's not just like we do need to educate consumers. We do need to communicate that value, but we also need to bring the producers along. Um, and so I wonder what are some of the, the biggest challenges that you'll, that that you are facing in your organizations as ethical and regenerative suppliers, but also that your producers are facing and what are the resources that you are reinvesting back into those communities that are, that seem to be the most uh, in demand for them to meet these regenerative goals. Yeah. Um, for us, from a, from the farmer's uh, perspective, it really is creating demand for all the different crops that um, crop rotation and regenerative environment really creates. So we are um, we have certain items that you know are within that re regenerative program, and quinoa gets um, rotationally cropped with lupini beans. Um, so we have to create a market for lupini beans now because 
there is every you know every other year or so or so on there's going to be this amount of lupini beans that they were just quinoa the year before and we have to pre provide and guarantee that market for farmers to really engage into um into the regenerative organic program chia seeds is a rotational crop with amaranth which is another indian grain so it's really understanding um how you're going to be able to balance that supply and demand lentils chickpeas um gigante beans from greece all three are rotational crops for us so we need to understand how we're going to be um educating and working with with partners that that the menu will need to change or your consumer habits your eating habits will need to change and to tucker's point it is better for you because you're going to have a, a more nutrient dense product that is within season that it is within um the time that it should be harvest versus having quinoa you know for five years and that creates a a macro um a field where the land, the soil is not getting to the health benefits and the health levels that you would want to really achieve the the kino that we know in the market high protein um, and essential amino acids a full plant protein profile that has made quinoa so popular but if you don't have that diversity into rotational then you're not going to be able to achieve those um those targets for certain items so for us from a farmer's perspective is um we're gonna we're gonna do this, but we also need to create that demand, and that's where Simply comes from um, to supporting them with that, and then also giving the stability that we'll buy we'll buy those harvests for you um, if we're invested into into creating something great together. Sorella, thank you so much for that one, and I would love to just keep riffing on that on that yeah. uh, on that train because it's such an important area in terms of biodiversity, crop diversity. Um, I'm going to take it in a different direction just so we can, you mm -hmm. know, talk about the spectrum of this, um, because I think your question was really about challenge, right? And um, I think the biggest challenge we face in regenerative agriculture is inequality. And the global inequality that we see, um, racial and social justice inequality, and, you know, as a white person, I understand I have a, an interesting and challenging place to play in, in that space. And, you know, food access is a huge part of inequality and access to global markets is a huge part of inequality. And, you know, unfortunately, the world that we inherited um, with its legacy of colonialism and mercantilism and all the things that happened is that we inherited a world that basically, um, was created and founded on the idea of inequality. And so we are in the process of trying to figure out a way forward. And, you know, without getting too long winded, you know, if you look at our products, right, they tend to be on the more expensive end of products, right? We're selling in the natural foods channel primarily, um, you know, we're in the whole foods and the sprouts and the independent grocers of the world, and certainly have crossed over into kind of you know, some level of mainstream grocery, but we, we current, I'm just going to be frank, we currently rely on consumers. And I actually hate that word. Let's stop using it. Customers that are um, willing and able to pay a little bit more for these products. And the reason is because we're taking that capital and we're giving it directly to farmers and we're paying them more. Right. And so we're living in this interesting moment where we're kind of shifting where if we're, if something's really cheap on the retail shelf in the United States, then that means a farmer somewhere probably got stepped on or didn't get paid a living wage for their product, right? Probably. I'm not going to say hundred percent of the time, but most of the time. And if you're looking at brands like Simply and Imlakesh, you know, we pay more than double the London exchange price for cacao to our farmers. We probably pay the highest price at any type of significant volume for cacao of any company in the world. And thus, we have to find customers, which we have many, many, many of them, um, some of which are on this call, um, that are going to support doing the right thing. And so I think that we need to shift that paradigm of inequality. And a big part of that is food access. And a big part of that is creating living wages at the, at the farm level. Yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that up. I think that 
for certainly within the regenerative agriculture sphere, I mean, white people have become sort of an outsized voice and face for regenerative agriculture, even though regenerative ag is rooted in, originated from indigenous practice and tradition. Um, and so navigating that space as a white supplier and making sure that you're not being extractive, but also as any supplier. And so I wonder, um, Sorella, if you could speak a little bit to how you can have suppliers that source ingredients from regions and communities where they don't reside can ensure that they're not being extractive and are injecting resources back into local economies and communities where that ingredient is being produced. And I know we've talked about a little bit of a higher price point and investing resources beyond financial, but I wonder if there's anything that we haven't touched on that you particularly think we should discuss. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, at Simply, we what we do different is that we work directly with farming communities, international farming communities. So we, you know, my we have team members that are in, within these communities and working with them day and night. So we truly understand um, some of the gaps and, and um, how they perceive buyers, specifically Western buyers of, of these items. And I think it just, it, it comes down to trust. Um, a lot of farming communities just don't trust the, um, why why are you trying to help me? Why are you coming to me and and trying to pay me higher price than the market is doing? Or what's what's for you? Um, and that it really has been because of the structure that um, that trading has been established. But in order to build those relationships with with farming communities, a fin financial support is great. But for them, in order to scale in order to really understand how its product can access a international market, um, education is key. So they really need to understand what are um, the things that they're doing today that are, are, are great, but also what are the gaps in their operations? Um, do they have um, you know, a, a small animal farm right next to some of the crops that they're growing and, and there could be some contamination um, within their water that they might not be, you know, thinking through those different steps. So education into a agricultural program is just really important and being able to support them with the gaps that they just don't see um, on the progress, the things that they're doing. Um, but also if a community is already more advanced and they are ready for that export market, it's just really being able to dive in deep and trust, but verify as well. And I think for anyone that is um, bringing products into US, Canada, Europe, it's your due diligence to really understand what these farming communities are doing. Um, you know, ask the tough questions. If you're working with a co-op, what is your... Um, what does your PL look like? How much are you paying the farmer, the small farmer directly? What are your gains going to? What are those um, incentives or initiatives that you're doing for that community? And not, I think not not every brand has the um, economies of scale of working directly with international small farmers, but they can work with bigger co-ops, which is great because you're still supporting that local economy of these communities. So be able to leverage and just really grow that relationship with the co-op, but verify what are their processes and really dive deep and ask those questions that you might not think you should be asking because it is your responsibility as you bring those items into the market. Totally, that idea of transparency. And I know that both Simply and you personally are really big about fighting food fraud. And I think you touched on this a little bit. And I also want to give Tucker the chance to jump in if, if he has anything that he'd like to contribute. But, um, you know, food fraud, is, food fraud is certainly misleading to consumer or to customers. Um, but I wonder, I wonder if you either of you could speak to how it's harmful to producers and suppliers as well. And I think that, Sorrel, you touched on how producers can sort of be uh, squeezed on either end. Um, by this food fraud, but I wonder if you could speak to it a little more. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, I think for for food fraud, it happens, you know, number one item in, in the food is olive oil, right? 78% of the olive oil in the market today has suffered somewhat of an alteration or 
um, some, you know, labeling or the product itself. And that just misleads and, and misguides the, the, pro the, cons the consumer, the customer um, on what the product is. So in order to really achieve that traceability, integrity, and visibility of the products that you're, that you're working on is just having ownership of, you know, again, checking balances, understanding the chain of the product for us, what we have seen um, just in order to achieve this and be more successful um, is just going to the source where the item grows and then oversee the whole process in between, bring the product in. Um, and that way we're cutting all the middlemen in between being able to shift those dollars back, as Tucker said, you know, support them um, financially through social and environmental campaigns, but being able to have control of the whole process truly for us is the way to, to um, have control of that integrity of the item. And if you have partners in between, you have to have those checking balances to understand what they're doing. When I go to my sourcing trips and I visit um, farming communities, you know, I've been, I've been sold product that is passing as organic, but it has a pesticide, you know, I do lab testing and it has pesticides in it, or I've been offered um, just all the things that you can think of that could happen internationally. And I'm sure Tucker has a lot of stories like that too. Um, it, you know, it happens. And the regulations of, of country of origin are different at the regulations that FDA or USDA can have. Um, so just doing that due diligence and really understanding what's happening at a country of origins that you're working on is critical because we cannot rely on to that every container, every product that is coming in is going to um, get lab tested or is going to get flagged by our regulation parties. So as a brand, we need to do that due diligence. Totally. And Tucker, I know that transparency is something that's super important to Imlakesh. And it, I could see you really nodding your head when Sorella said, I'm sure Tucker has a million stories like this as well. Um, so I wonder if you want to jump in and talk about how you guys value and, and are able to enforce feels like a strong word, but yeah, you know, maybe enforce the transparency standards that you have put in place. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you again, Sorella, because you're just like, you're so spot on with everything you're saying. I really, I really appreciate it. Um, you're making my job easy. <laughs> uh, you know, I would just add that, you know, I think regenerative sourcing, it's not a suit and tie kind of job. You know, it's, you don't just like send some executive down to like shake a couple hands and make some deals and sign some contracts and leave, you know, and it, it requires um, relationship. It requires trust and uh, it takes time. And I think that it needs to be built into the soul of an organization. And, and I hope that, you know, you guys are interviewing Cargill in a couple of weeks. I'm so interested to hear what they have to say. Right. Um, and, you know, to me, you know, I started uh, in Lakesh when I was living in Peru and I kind of threw my life to the wind and moved to South America on a one way ticket and a backpack. And, you know, I've, I've had the incredible privilege to, to really sit at the feet of a lot of indigenous nations around the world. You know, I've lived in, I've lived in Guatemala. I've lived in the Solomon Islands off the coast of Papua New Guinea. Um, I've lived deep in the Amazon rainforest and up in the Andes. And, you know, I've spent about three years of my life with no running water and electricity. And that's the kind of thing that, that changes you. And, um, you know, when you're sleeping in a hammock on somebody's porch and working on their farm, um, that's, you know, that's really what this is about, right? Because then people see you for who you are and then they actually, they begin to trust you. And Sorella really talked a lot about that trust, right? Which is, which is this huge element of, you know, a lot of farmers don't actually have a whole lot of reason to trust us because they've never had the experience of been, being given that trust back the other way. And so, you know, I wish I could sit here and tell you that this is like a clean, easy business but you know sourcing is a it's a messy business and we're dealing with 500 years of history you know and the work that we're doing every day and so i try to carry that um in every conversation and every interaction i have and sometimes i do a good job sometimes i don't um but i always try to start with listening you know i always try to start with asking questions i always try to start with listening and again i think being um receptive right is like really um not being that like outward force that has that um prescriptive i know what's right let's do it this way 
we can implement all these scientific practices. We can have all this technical assistance. We can do all these things that are like the right way to make this happen, right? Instead, it's this process of, hey, what do y'all do? You know, tell me about your agriculture, you know, talking to them about their community, talking about what the needs are. Um, you know, what are the challenges? What do they feel like they're doing well? Where do they need help, right? And, and this process of really, um, listening and creating a dialogue before you start, you know, trying to do good and then eventually getting to that regenerative paradigm. Cause you can't get to that regenerative paradigm if you don't actually understand the essence of the community or the place that you're working. Right. And that idea, and I think that's part of why I'm so grateful for the series, for you both, for all the speakers who come and, and speak with us, because it's that community building, it's that communication. We need more passionate messengers who have been on the ground, who interact directly with suppliers and are able to carry the message and the hard work that is going on that like that often gets lost when it's just the product that's traveling from one place to another, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I'd like to also take it back to something that you were talking about earlier, Tucker, um, when, it, when it comes to food access. Um, and a big part, there, there's such a fine line um, between, you know, rotational crops, finding a market for, for something, a new crop, something that's new to the market. Uh, convincing consumers to go for it, and then it becomes a trendy ingredient. And then it's really hard to maintain that integrity at scale with these regenerative, what, what were originally a regenerative crop. And so scalability is really important when it comes to economies of scale and bringing the price down on some of these regenerative ingredients, making them accessible to people who are not shop, they're shopping at, you know, shop and save, not at Whole Foods. Um, and so I wonder, I know that's a lot. <laughs> uh, I just brought a lot of like very big issues into one run on sentence, but I wonder if either of you could speak a little bit to how you are tackling this problem of scalability of regenerative ingredients. I mean, Sorella, I'd, I'd love to hear from you on this since you work with quinoa. Um, and I've spent, I've spent a lot of time in Huancayo and Huanuco and Ayacucho and, you know, all those areas working with quinoa. Um, and, you know, it's obviously, it's, it's a lot of people ask questions about it as a contentious ingredient. And, you know, I'm really interested to hear from your perspective, because I have my own viewpoint about it and have, I've talked about it a lot, but I'd really love to learn from you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, for us, regenerative organic program is, is the top where we want to get all our farmers to, right? But that is a very long journey for farmers that, you know, are starting at a conventional level. So what we've been able to create a model that is sustainable, scalable for us is understanding that not, not everyone in the market is going to understand right off the bat regenerative organic or you know the difference between conventional product and organic, right? That right there is, is, a, is a big um, educational moment. So we've created different programs within the items that we work with. Uh, if it's quinoa, if it's amaranth, lupini, chia, oils, beans, and so on, where we have conventional farming uh, practices, the farmers that are working within that, and then we create a program to transition to organic. So that could take anywhere from one year or three years, right? Based on how um, the practices that they were doing before, if there's any trace of chemicals within the product or, or the soil. So we have that program for the farmers that are starting right at the beginning. Um, once they achieve that organic certification, then we get them into the second program, which is regenerative organic, right? In being able to, to get to the next level, um, being able to have the right working conditions. We have to go through fair trade or fair for life and just really understanding how these communities are formed. What does their leadership look like? Um, what are they tracking? How is everyone benefiting from this? So there's different steps to the ladder to get to regenerative, to get to that top uh, program that, that we want to get to and being able to have product that is accessible at all levels. So the customer can um, make that choice and eventually achieve to the top, but let's all of us go through that journey with our farmers and customers. 
so essentially it's mostly the the battle right now is about making sure that farmers can get to that level of regenerative and then we can tackle this idea of letting the consumers you know and customers make their own decisions tucker what do you what do you think about that you asked a pretty big question i'm interested where i'm going to take this you know, I, I'm actually going to take it in the direction of certification because I think we're really this is a this is a trade group here. You know, this is mostly people in the industry. Um, at some point, and Sorelli, you actually alluded to this kind of in the early part of our conversation, which is that you know, regenerative is pretty rapidly becoming diluted as an idea, um, and you know, the big challenge is that we've got. You know, and, and I don't have anything wrong with this, but I'm if it sounds like I do, I don't really. But, you know, on this side, you've got Cargill and Kashi and, you know, brands that are going, we're regenerative because we're converting monocrop conventional almonds to monocrop organic almonds. Right. And I think a lot of us would say, well, it's not really regenerative agriculture. Um, and I think the challenge we have with regenerative and it, as it as it applies to certification is that, you know, regeneration at its core as a concept is really this idea of improving a place and not really improving a place, but having an environment uh, become closer and closer and more realized in its full potential of, of what it wants to be in the world, right? Um, and that's like, if you clear cut the rainforest, we can look at that and say, that's not what the rainforest wants to be. It's pretty obvious to us, right? But this question of what does the rainforest want to be? What does that actually look like? How are we uplifting its essence so it can be what it wants to be? And I think this question of certification comes back to how do we not dilute this space and how do we communicate with the customer, right? Because I think probably most of us on this call have been trained to look for that little white and green logo that's a circle that's on a lot of the products that we want to buy. And if it's not on there, we kind of like really pick it up and we really read it. And we really decide is there an organic option or not. And at the moment, you know, the customer in a store, I mean, most of them have no idea what regeneration is um, or regenerative agriculture is, but what's starting to shift is that what I call the gatekeepers, um, meaning the buyers for brick and mortar, right? Or the people that, the people that make the decisions about what people decide to buy. Um, they are starting to have this conversation, this understanding, right? And Whole Foods launched a program on regenerative agriculture. Sprouts launched a program on regenerative agriculture, right? So you have these big retailers that are now supporting brands like Simply and Imlakesh. Um, and so there's this trickle down effect that's happening within the system. And I think we're, at, we're now at that level of thought leaders and suppliers moving into this space of industry and gatekeepers right and you know i'm i'm personally close with um you know the folks at dr bronner's the folks at patagonia and some of the great people that have helped develop the regenerative organic certification you know and i've been very clear with both of them is that i don't necessarily disagree or agree with certification i'm very much like walking the fence in terms of whether i think we should do a certification um in the last year, I've come closer and closer to the idea that I think I'm in favor of certification, just because I think that the potential for this movement to rapidly get watered down, right? You could say it took 30 years for organic to start to, you know, lose some of its integrity. And I'm afraid this might happen in 10 if we don't certify, um, because we need to get to the place. And just to wrap this up, because I realized I went on a little bit of a road there is we need to get to a place where the end customer can look at a product, can look at the choice of something they're going to nourish their body with, and in two seconds say, I know this is good for me, and I know that it's good for the planet, and I know it because I recognize this logo that says this is a good thing, and somebody else has already figured it out that, and done all the work and done all the certification to figure it out, right? In the same way that we're looking for that little green and white circle on products. So I'll leave it there for now. Certainly. And I think that's very well said. I think, you know, a big part of the struggle with those consumer communications is figuring out 
this sort of funnel of understanding and not wanting to overwhelm the customer with too much information, giving them something that they can see quickly in the supermarket and just know that that is something that's, if not the best, it's at least better than the alternative. And, but I, I, I and I think you also spoke to this on maybe a broader scale, um, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how because we do have suppliers and brands who are on this call now. And so I'd love to hear from you two what those ingredient suppliers and brands can do to kind of meet smaller scale regenerative suppliers and producers in the middle to overcome some of these obstacles of consistency or scalability or transparency. Um, what would make your jobs easier? Oh, it's so fun, Leah. This is such a fun question. <laughs> Um, you know, I think this comes down to that same idea of like, you don't do this with a suit and tie on, you know, you do it because it's the right thing to do and because you care. And just because some community can't produce a hundred metric tons or a thousand metric tons or 10 metric tons of a certain product, it doesn't mean that, um, you can't work with them and that you can't build a long, if, if you're really in it for the long haul, if you're really saying, you know, hey, I'm going to show up for at least the next 10 years, I'm hoping to show up for the next 50 years, then you create that relationship. If you're trying to, you know, make a handshake deal and get the best price and then, you know, move on to somebody else next year when they have a better price, then, you know, that's not what we're doing here. Right. And so, you know, and, Patagonia has done a really amazing job of that, right? And some of the supply chains and ingredients that they work with. Um, so for me, it's about really assessing the, the potential, right? And again, this is another big concept in regenerative framework is potential, right? Does this community, um, does this ecosystem, does this place have potential? Is there a lot of like, is there a lot of will there, right? Is there a lot of intrinsic will within this community that they want to do the right thing, that they want to scale, that they want to take care of the land in their, in their community? And if that's the case, then, you know, you can launch a product. Maybe you only launch a product direct to consumer, right? And you don't launch it nationwide. And then for a year or two years or three years, you incrementally grow the supply chain. Maybe you make investments where you plant um, you know, 10,000 trees, right? Like we're doing this with Macombo right now, right? We're the, we're the only and largest importer of Macombo in the world. It's an amazing source of protein um, and super good for, for the brain and neurological health. Um, wild harvested from the Amazon, right? So it takes years for those trees to mature. And so we're, we've developed a, a very robust market for the product and we are partnering with communities to increase the supply chain over a period of years, right? And so I think that that's really the key is, is it's about potential, it's about time, and again, about building that long-term partnership. Yeah, yeah, I think um, Tucker covered all the good points. I think potential, it's key, is just really assessing who are the right farmers and partners that are um, that have potential to, to grow and being able to just create a scalable um, model where you start small with the idea of, of growing that. Um, but to add to that, I think it's also education, right? Like farmers are great at farming. They're great at being on the field or being out there, taking care of the crops, taking care of that biodiversity that, that we want to have. But they are not great at the paperwork that comes along with um, keeping track of those fields. They're not great at placing their orders for the seeds that they might need or you know, doing the math to understand yields and all that. So education, providing those tools that um, you know, someone that is sitting behind the desk can, can do and support easily, they would they appreciate that so much because for them is so inaccessible to do that. So just being able to help them with education on how the tools that we have in our day-to-day -to, -day to help them achieve um, efficiency within their operations is also key. Um, that's incredible. Thank you so much for those answers. I am just loving having learning so much from you both. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I really wanna to get to, but I also wanna ask kind of a follow-up question about education. So, you're, we've talked a lot about how 
um, farmer education can be something that's really helpful and important. I wonder if there's anything that either on a large scale for your organizations that you guys have learned from your producers or even on a smaller scale, like a, in just a personal, on a personal level, a skill or um, a word or anything that you've learned that you'd like to share. How to use a machete. <laughs> I'm still not very good. Like I'm, I'm like, you know, they still laugh at me a lot, but um, for, for a gringo white boy, I'm like pretty good with a machete. <laughs> that's amazing you need that if you go to the amazon right you yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah. <laughs> um i mean there's so many things that you learn from the farmers right like there's so many amazing things that, that you go and just um just little skill like life lifestyle skill sets that you learn that you wouldn't be able to learn anywhere else um just understanding their perspective of happiness i think to me has been really amazing um growing up i grew up in peru myself but haven't really spent it that much time in the andes until had the, the journey of um of being in the food industry and simply and just really understanding how small communities or the the happiness of farmers is compared to sometimes happiness can be um in our in, we get lost in this world so um i think that to me was was really incredible yeah. And I know you're based in Washington, DC and I'm, I'm in Brooklyn, so I can understand the, yep. uh, the appeal. I would love to be able to spend some time learning about that, that version of happiness myself. Mm -hmm. um, okay, great. And I'd love to get to these two questions in the chat. And I think both kind of get back to what we were talking a little bit and you specifically Tucker about certifications. Um, and one is, is it possible for um, regenerative sourcing to happen, even if there aren't already complex transparency frameworks in place. Um, and similarly, is it possible for something to be regenerative, even if it's not organic? And I think that that's something that comes up a lot um, in, during these conversations is, are they mutually exclusive? And how can you work toward helping people understand? And what's your understanding of it? Yeah, I, yeah, I could, I could add some, some color to that. Um, so for certification, um, you have to have USDA organic certification as well as um, a, you know, a fair for life or um, fair trade certification to have the basis to um, develop that regenerative organic plan um, for for the farmers. So in order to achieve certification, yes. Um, but in order to have a regenerative farming operation, um, I don't think they're completely mutually exclusive with, um, with a framework of transparency. I think that a framework of transparency is put in place to communicate that product to whoever you are selling it or to the market. Um, but a farmer can operate with regenerative farming practices like they've been doing for thousands of years without uh, being able to have that, that framework to follow. Um, but in order to achieve and in being able to align a product with certification, um, you, you will have to go through the certifications of organic as well as um, fair for life or fair trade. Great. Yeah, I'll Thank just you. try to bri briefly add to that, which is to say that on that first question around in-depth um, frameworks being in place, I think if it's really small, it's possible to do it without, but anything over 20 farmers, you need to have that transparency in place, right? Because what happens is, oh, well, you're paying 10% or 15% more than the market for the regenerative product. Then all of a sudden, you know, so-and-so's neighbor is going to like throw their harvest of conventional cacao or quinoa in with the regenerative stuff and then sell it. And there'll be like a little side deal, pay the money back off. You know, like that's what we're talking about. And those are the like real, you know, elements that, that exist. And so, you know, to me, that's like one of the big challenges, right. Is like, Personally, I think we should charge Cargill and Mars and all those companies. They should pay a degenerative tax and then all that money should actually go to pay for all the organic certification in the world, right? Like you should have to be, you have to pay money 
a lot of it to spray pesticides and put nitrogen fertilizer on your crops. And then all of that money should actually go to subsidize organic and regenerative agriculture. It's not even that crazy of an idea. It's really not, you know, it's, we're just it's happening fantastic. the other way right now. Like we're paying, you know, $50,000 to be have organic certification. You know, I bet all of our farming communities together to get certified organic, I bet they spend $400,000 a year on organic certification, right? So that's $400,000 that are not in the pockets of people that make $2,000 a year, $3,000 a year, right? It's significant money. And you know, I don't have any problem speaking truth to power because there's no way that we're going to change this unless we do, right? So, yeah. you know, this is, this is the place that we're at. Now, at the same time, one of the cool things about organic certification that I found is we literally certified our, facility, our first facility organic in 2013. It was 110 square feet. I don't know if you guys know, that's a 10 by 11 foot space. Uh, we were the smallest certified organic facility ever in California. And part of what it does is it makes you get your acts together because from a traceability standpoint, from a documentation standpoint, from a in and out, how you're selling things, how you're buying things, it really keeps things in order. And so there's a lot of benefits to it on top of just having a piece of paper that are really helpful. But I do think um, that we need to get to a place where the, the costs and expenses of this are actually borne by the people that are causing the problem. Absolutely. And in that, I think in that spirit of just not simply being sustainable, right? Not just um, not doing bad, but moving toward doing good, being becoming regenerative. How has your idea of being a regenerative supplier and an ethical sourcing organization evolved since you started your your business and and what do you see it evolving into in the next five years let's say yeah um for me it was just a lot of learning at first um just a lot of learning on differences between what's already in the market versus what is regenerative you know i i grew up i grew up in peru eating fruit and vegetables that you know tasted amazing and going to you know the amazon in iquitos um with my father for for trips and all these amazing um, superfoods that you can find in, in Lakesh, right? Like I grew up with that in, in my diet. So when I moved to the US, not being able to find a, you know, amazing strawberry or amazing orange that you can just see the color, you know, when you cut and smell it, which is so bizarre to me that um, that thought of that you can find strawberries in your, so in your local supermarket all year round. And that is the expectation for the customer that it was that I just couldn't comprehend that thought. So really understanding how the customer thinks today of the products that are in the market versus what the farmer is growing was just a huge educational moment for me personally. And I think regenerative organic um, was something that these communities have been doing, right? For thousands of years, but how do they, how do they get that credit for their work or how do they get that higher pay? Um, how do they get that um, distinguishable product on the shelves versus another brand that might be claiming that, right? The, clim the, the claims of single origin or climate friendly or just the word regenerative are being so overused in the market. So it really, really pushed me to certification. Um, to just really being able to align ourselves with other brands that are doing this. Our voice is going to be stronger together. Let's go through the journey, understand what do we need to do um, in order to, to have that being certified. As Stucker mentioned, having that logo so the consumer only has two seconds to, um, to validate its consumer pick and know that the people have done the work behind the scenes. And um, I think in five years, I mean, Regenerative organic today is what I think organic was 20 years, right? And we're just at the peak of it right now. Um, Whole Foods just launched is, um, is a standard, so what it is for the customers. Um, so being able to, to take that voice with, with our partners and obviously Patagonia has been a huge supporter with Dr. Bronner on that initiative. It's how do we now be able to, um, to continue to aid the consumer? And I think here in five years, we're still going to be somewhat of uh, not 
as the, in the beginning of it, but it's still going to be an uphill battle to continue to spread that message. Well said, well said. I'll just add that I think the biggest thing that's changed for me um, is just around language, right? In the last, I've been doing this for, I don't know, almost a decade. <laughs> and uh, the biggest thing that's changed for me is my language and ability to describe something that I could, I could feel, but didn't actually have the words to express and impart to others what was going on. And I have a lot of um, mentors, um, you know, both, both farmers and, um, major thought leaders in this space that have really helped to, to spur this conversation forward and give us, you know, bring words like agroforestry and soil food web and, you know, essence and potential and capacity in the way that they're defined in ways that we can really, um, utilize them because in, in many ways, I think that we're, trying to take the English language and describe something that in my experience, indigenous people have known from the dawn of time. And so, you know, it's not a very easy language to understand these concepts in, but until we have the language to be able to describe and express it to the end customer and to everybody along the value chain, I think we're going to continue to think in a degenerative mind. And so honestly, the biggest thing that's changed is for me is my own mind about how this gets done. And so that's, you know, I, I encourage each and every one of you to, um, if you're interested in this work, um, to spend as much time as you can really, really outside, like really don't bring your phone and really, you know, be somewhere that's wild, as wild as you can find that's close to where you live. Um, and also to really just engage the work, um, you know, Ethan, um, Solaviv, who's one of the main folks at How Good. He has an incredible mind, a lot of amazing podcasts and thought leadership pieces. Um, Carol Sanford um, with the Regenerative Business uh, Institute is an incredible resource. And to just like connect into these, um, these ways that we can, we can shift our thinking because through shifting our thinking, I think we're actually gonna reach a place where we can um, take action in a way that's, that's not degenerative, but actually regenerative. Absolutely. That was very well said, both of you. Thank you so much. I think that's just a perfect way to wrap up our time together. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Be sure to check out Imlakesh and Simply. They both have so many delicious uh, ingredients and in their shop, I'm particularly looking forward to trying uh, a few of them. And uh, we hope to see you at our next session, which will be on October 7th. So thank you so much for joining and we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, Leah.